It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm very grateful to my hosts, Julian and James, and it's great to be, be contributing to this great tradition of Royal Institute of Philosophy lectures. Uh, is, is the volume okay? Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Um, so um, this, the, the, the topic I'm gonna talk about in this talk today is something I've been thinking about for a long time. And one of the things that prompted my thinking about it is arguing with my children, my children who were grown up and very argumentative. Um, one of them is a philosopher and the other is almost a philosopher. And uh, it was about GPS, because I didn't like the idea of just using a GPS sort of to, you know, not, not understanding where you're going in the car, the route, and where you're going to and from, and instead just blindly following the instructions of something. And I felt there was something wrong about this, and they thought it was fine. So, so this, is, this is the result of trying to provide philosophical underpinning for a sort of a, a gut reaction I had to this. So that's a bit about the sort of genesis. And it, it is, it's going to be relevant when we get to the moral at the end. OK. Um, so, so the hand, let me say, the handout, I've actually left. I, 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 I've just been away for a week, and I had to produce the handout rather quickly. I, I've actually left some stuff out from the handout that there probably won't be time for, but I'll tell you when we get to the bits that are being left out. Okay, so in the modern world, there's a great division of labor, both practical and epistemic. We all depend on others to exercise practical and or epistemic skills on one's behalf that one lacks oneself. Okay, so that's my opening question. What does that mean? Um, well, firstly, episteme is the Greek word for knowledge. So epistemic skills are knowledge-getting skills. For, exam for example, someone who's an expert on birds has a knowledge base which enables them to get new knowledge when they're out on a walk, which someone lacking that skill couldn't get. They can recognize birds by their appearance, by their call, by their manner of flight, etc., on the walk. And for example, a trained lab technician can get knowledge about a blood sample. They'll be able to sort of tell you things about you know, what's in it through looking at it down the microscope, which someone without the expertise couldn't get. So in both those cases, they've got a knowledge and skill basis which enables them to generate new knowledge on fresh knowledge on a particular occasion. So that's what I mean by having an epistemic skill. It's a knowledge-getting skill that enables you to generate new knowledge. Um, practical skills are what they sound like. They're skills at doing something, a skilled activity. Many such skills are teleological. That's to say they have an end product, an output, which the skill is aimed at producing. Um, for example, a cabinet maker can make a beautiful piece of furniture, and a skilled baker can bake a delicious cake, etc. Okay, so that's the idea of epistemic skills and practical skills. It should be immediately obvious to all of you that in the conditions of our modern life, we rely hugely on the epistemic and practical skills of others, skills that oneself lacks for things that we need, things that we need, or at least things that we very much like having. Um, for example, I rely on my car mechanic to find out and tell me what the fault is with my car when it won't start, and then to fix it for me. And one relies on one's doctor to use information from um, symptoms and medical tests to firstly diagnose what is wrong with one, and then to prescribe an appropriate treatment. One relies on the builders who built one's house, the firm that made one's TV, one's washing machine, one's computer, the list of all these, these products we rely on of the skills of others, and also others' expert knowledge that, that we lack the skills to be able to generate, we rely on all the time. Okay, so two points from those examples. Firstly, most skills in fact involve a practical and an epistemic element, as in the car mechanic example. But we'll we can categorize a skill as practical when we're focusing on the material output of it, e.g. a repaired functioning car or a beautiful cabinet. And we'll think of it as an epistemic skill where we're thinking of the, some items of knowledge as its output. So that's the first point. Secondly, sometimes our reliance is directly on other people who have skills we lack for the use of their specialist skills, as with the doctor and the car mechanic. But very often, what we depend on directly are sophisticated technological devices and machines. Um, and we're relying indirectly on the specialist skills of those who designed and produced them, as with our washing machine, car, when I'm using it to get somewhere, my laptop, my mobile phone, etc. And again, the list seems almost endless of all these things in modern life where we just rely on and take for granted the skills of others that have produced these things that we use every day. And we very often have very little idea about how they work or what their basis is. 
So it's just about imaginable that one could renounce all this and go for a lifestyle where you don't rely on any of these products of other specialist skills that we lack. I mean, you could, you know, you could go and sort of try and live, you know, a very simple life in a community where you grow your own food and, you know, don't, etc. So it's just about imaginable, but it would be a very extreme move to make. And it's, it's not feasible. We can't maintain anything like our present lifestyle without relying on all these devices. No one, no one can learn all the skills that they rely on. No one has enough time to learn how to be a doctor and a builder and a mechanic and etc. etc. So barring heroic and quixotic self-denial in one's lifestyle, we're stuck with this modern predicament of our epistemic and practical dependence on others. So I'm certainly not going to suggest today that we should go in for this heroic self-denial. And indeed, it would be crazy. We gain huge riches from our reliance on the practical and epistemic skills of others. And this is a large part of the advance of civilization, is this division of labor which allows us to do that. Um, it's made all of us enormously better off, both in material terms and epistemically. Most of what we know of history, geography, science, and so forth, we know only because we've trusted the word of others, and very often the others got their knowledge due to their specialised epistemic skills that one lacks oneself. So this is our modern predicament, and we clearly can't get out of it, and I'm, I don't think there's any reason why we should, and the rest of the talk is going to show there's no reason why we should. But I do think we should ask some questions about it. Um, and the questions, they're not idle, because although it's not realistic to give up all one's epistemic and practical dependence on others, um, and no one could personally acquire all the skills they're going to rely on the outputs of during their lifetime. Nonetheless, over time, we do have choices. Choices confront us as to which skills one should seek to acquire, and which skill, skills one's happy, one's content to go on letting others exercise on one's behalf. So one could try and minimise one's dependence on others, even though one can't rule it out entirely. Um, so the question I'm going to consider today is, is there something of value that one misses out on by not exercising a skill oneself and instead relying on others to exercise it on one's behalf? For example, I have total epistemic and practical dependence on my mechanic vis-a-vis -vis how th things stand with my car and its potential repair. Would it be in some way better for me if I had the epistemic and practical skills to allow me to diagnose the fault in my car and repair it myself? That's just one example, but you see the point I'm making. So this question about the car turns on broader questions about the normative status of epistemic and practical dependence and the normative potential value of skills, epistemic and practical. That's to say, in non-technical language, we need to think about the goodness or badness of, depending, of being dependent on others. Is it in some way bad to be dependent on others, in which case we should try to avoid it? Um, and is it in some way good to have and exercise skills, in which case it's something we might want to cultivate? Um, so one point I want to, the point I want to make, you might think that dependence is bad. If you think depending on others is bad, then that's a reason to acquire skills in order to avoid having this dependence. That's not the question I want to ask today. I want to ask the question whether there's something intrinsically valuable about having and exercising skills oneself. So having skills to avoid the bad of dependence is not today's topic, OK? Um, so here are the questions. Should one seek to acquire epistemic and practical skills? Should one seek to acquire as many as possible? If not all, then which ones should one seek to acquire? And are there certain skills that each one of us has reason to seek to acquire? More broadly, should one worry about humans generally becoming increasingly de-skilled as more and more sophisticated devices are invented that take over skilled tasks that previously could only be done by humans? So, we already have the cars that park themselves and park cars that when you get too close to a car in front, they break, you know. So um, the, the responsibility for making sure you don't crash into the car in front is being taken away from you because the machine is doing it instead. Apparently, we're going to have self-driving cars soon. So I think this raises a question, you know, that we should at least think about what's happening to us as humans when all these machines are taking over all these skills that used to be distinctively human. Um, 
So in order to answer these questions, what I'm going to consider in the talk today is whether having and exercising skills is in some way a good thing for humans, whether having and exercising skills is a worthwhile part, is an important part of a worthwhile human life. And I'm going to see if I can argue that it is using relatively uncontroversial materials, using the least controversial materials. Because, of course, I could just say, well, as a philosopher, I say that exercising skills is an important part of a worthwhile human life, and then it would just be a one-liner. But that's a sort of tendentious view. I'm going to see if we can get to this without having to assume it as a premise. OK. OK, so here's a kind of objection, which is, What's all the fuss about? This has been happening, you know, for the two and a half thousand years. And apparently, um, when writing was invented, various sort of ancient philosophers kicked up a fuss that this was really bad because the skill of learning long, long poems, etc., by heart was going to die out now that you could write them down. Um, and of course, it probably is true. And I mean, throughout the history of, you know, development of civilization and technology, um, D development of, of technological devices has mean, meant we don't no longer have to have skills that we used to have. Um, and of course, when you get a new, I mean, so when you get a new machine, which means you don't need an old skill, you do need a new skill, which is the skill of using the machine. Okay, so for example, maybe maybe with you know everyone now has laptops and computers, maybe people aren't going to be able to handwrite anymore, but they have to be able to type. You know, and um, maybe now that everyone has calculators, kids aren't going to learn to do arithmetic anymore, but instead they're going to learn you know how to work the calculator. So you might say, look, let's just relax. We're getting new skills and different skills instead of the old ones. And I'm certainly not wanting to sort of give a Luddite moral at all. But I do think that maybe things are going so fast and getting a bit out of control that we do need to say, hey, wait a minute, let's just check what's going on here and if we are losing out on something that's distinctively human and important. OK, so... I want to look at whether having and exercising skills is something that's valuable for humans in itself. Okay, and so I formulated four principles about skills, and I'm going to see whether we can give an argument for them for, from relatively uncontroversial premises. So on your handout, this is now section two on the handout, I've got four principles about skills, starting with the strongest one and then moving down. So the strongest one is called... So RAS stands for reason to acquire skills. So unrestricted reason to acquire skills says for any skill, practical or epistemic, that one lacks and is able to acquire, each of, us, each of us, each one of us has some reason to acquire and sometimes exercise that skill where this is not merely an instrumental reason. So just to explain some vocabulary in that, when I say have some reason to acquire it, this is like just... It's not an overwhelming reason. It could be a very weak reason. And even if, you th even if you think it's true that for every skill I could acquire, I have some reason to acquire it. Obviously, in most cases, it's going to be defeated, just because no one, however energetic and capable, has time to acquire all the skills that, in principle, they might. So, for example, supposing I think I have some reason to learn Russian because I'd enjoy reading Russian poetry, and I can't do that unless I can speak Russian. Um, but, I mean, maybe I just love poetry, and for any language with a good literature, I have some reason to learn that language so I can read its literature. So I have some reason to learn Chinese, some reason to learn Japanese. But obviously, I can't learn them all. So the reason is going to have to be defeated in most cases. So this is quite a weak principle. There's some reason. I probably won't be able to do it, but there's, there's something, as it were, I'm missing out on if I don't. So that's just clarifying the idea of some reason. Um, and when I say it's not merely instrumental reason... It's not that I have a reason to do it because it will further some further end beyond the skill. So, for example, I might have a reason to learn to play golf and get, playing, get good at playing golf if kind of um, playing golf with, you know, by business partners is an important way to further my business career. That would be a reason to learn to play golf and play golf, but it's, it's not, it's an instrumental reason. It's because it's a means to some further objective. So I, I want it to be a reason to do the activity, which isn't just because it's a means to some further object, objective. It's, a, it's worthwhile in itself. Okay. So I'm looking for whether there's some non-instrumental reason. And the first principle is the idea that for every skill I could acquire, I have some 
reason to acquire it. Um, and just to say, I'm going to argue that, well, there, there certainly aren't any uncontroversial, as it were, premises from which you can derive that. And I'm going to suggest today it seems false. Um, so here's the next one, which I call certain reason to, certain RES. So that says that for each one of us, there's a certain set of skills such that one has, one has some reason for each skill in the set to acquire and sometimes exercise it. Um, so that says for each person, there's a certain bunch of skills that she has some reason to acquire them. And this could be different from person to person. Um, what I'm actually going to preview, what I'm going to argue about this is this is true. What's true is for each person, she has some reason to, to acquire the skills which are the ones that she would enjoy exercising. And of course, that's going to vary from person to person. So one person's enjoyable, one person's sort of thrilling, at kind of thrilling, big thrill like skydiving, and another person's terrifying nightmare. So if you'd enjoy skydiving, you have some reason to acquire the skill of skydiving. Um, but if you're not the adventurous type, but you love opera, you have some reason to acquire the skill of understanding the musical language of Wagner, so you can appreciate his operas. So that's going to be idiosyncratic. For each person, there's some bunch of skills such they have reason to acquire them, but which they are could vary from person to person. And I am going to argue there's a pleasure or enjoyment-based um, uh, basis for that principle. So third principle is different from the second principle. It also says there's some skills, but there's, there's difference of scope for people like scope distinctions. The first one says for each person, there's a certain set of skills such that they have reason to acquire them. And the second one says for each person, there's some reason to acquire that they have, a, they have some skills. So each of us has reason to ensure that we aren't entirely skill-less, that there's some skills that we have. And I'm also going to argue that that's plausibly true. Um, I'll explain why later on. And then the fourth principle, which is the most conjectural one and the one which actually I'm most interested in, is the idea that called, it's called core RAS on your handout, that there's a certain set of broad skill types such that, such that each one of us has some reason to ensure for every skill type in the set that she has and sometimes exercises a skill of that type. So there's a certain set of core skills which each one of us has some reason to acquire. Particular core broad skill set. Okay. Okay, so those are the four principles I want to look at to see if we can find an uncontroversial argument for them. The skill, the principles talk about having reason to acquire a skill. So I need to say a little bit about that. So these reasons are normative reasons, and this is the sort of notion that gets used in philosophy. So a, re a normative reason for doing something is a reason for doing that thing. Um, so a person has a normative reason to do a certain action, call it fying, when, well, this is a thesis I'm making, you have a normative reason to fy when fying has some property that counts in favour of performing it for you. So for me to have a normative reason to fine, there must be something about fying that counts in favour of fying for me. Um, something about it that makes it worth doing for me. And then the kind of worthwhileness I'm thinking about is going to be a prudential normative reason for fying, what I'll call a PN reason for short. So there's something about fying that makes fying a good thing to do for A from A's point of view. There's something in it for A, as it were. So what I'm ruling out is like moral reasons. So it's not that you should fire because it's going to benefit somebody else. I'm talking about things that are going to benefit you, as it were. That means you have a prudential normative reason for fying. And I'm also going to assume that the property of fying that confers this PN reason on it is that fying would contribute could contribute positively to A's well-being, to how well, well A's life goes for her. So you have a PN reason to fi if fying would, would, would contribute to the, your well-being, how well your life goes for you. Um, so just where we've got to, a person A has a PN reason to fi just if fying will in some way contribute positively to her welfare or well-being. So this principle tells us what we need to show for each of our principles to establish it. We need to establish that the possession or exercise of skills as specified in the principle must in itself directly contribute to the agent's well-being. So having and exercising the skills have got to contribute to the agent's well-being. 
Okay, well-being is a notion that's very, very much discussed in moral philosophy, and there are different accounts of what it is, but I'm, again, I'm going to take the least controversial view, which is that at least uncontroversial ingredients of well-being, and ones that are undeniably motivating as features of prospective actions, are pleasure and enjoyment and happiness. So, so um, it's going to contribute to your well-being if it's going to give you pleasure or happiness, okay. So I said I'm going to try, I'm trying to use the least controversial materials in, in arguing for these principles. So, I mean, there may be other arguments using more controversial principles. I'm not saying these are the only arguments there are, but I'm just seeing how far we can get with just these materials, that you have, to, you have, reason to, have a prudential reason to do something if doing it's going to make you happy or give you a kind of happiness or a joy enjoyment you couldn't have without doing it. Okay. How am I doing for time, actually? I'm doing pretty well, aren't I? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I may actually finish early, which would be good, I think. Okay, so a um, little word about what skills are. So I said at the beginning that we have epistemic skills and practical skills. I'm mainly going to be focusing on practical skills, really, in the rest of the argument. Um, so skills and abilities, are they just the same thing? Well, here I'm kind of legislating, but one way in which we can think of abilities and skills as related are if we think that, well, to say that you have the ability to do something means roughly that um, if you were to try to do it, you'd succeed, and that's true across, a, you, you would try and would succeed across a sufficiently wide, wide range of possible circumstances. So I have the ability to hit the target in archery if, if I were to try to hit the target in a reasonably broad range of normal conditions, I would succeed in hitting the target. So if that's what abilities are, they're just dispositions to succeed, then we can think of skills as the mediators of abilities. The, the skill is what I have which, as it were, grounds my ability. I'm able to hit the target in archery because I'm a skilled archer. My skill explains why and how I'm able to achieve this success. And it's, it's, it's worthwhile distinguishing between skills and abilities if we think that the same ability could be could be grounded in rather different skills. So someone might have the skill of baking because they like follow the instructions very, very carefully. Somebody else might have the, so have the ability to bake a cake because they follow the instructions very carefully. Another person might not follow any instructions at all but just do it all kind of by instinct but get the same result. There's a sense in which they've got a different skill but it subserves the same ability. Um, Okay, so skills and abilities come in great variety, from whistling and swimming to cake baking and cabinet making, from the skills of a good launderer to those of a research astrophysicist. In one sense, any skill and any ability has a proprietary intended outcome. But in some cases, it's simply engaging in the skilled activity. So swimming, I think, is a skilled activity, but doesn't have any outcome except the fact that you, know, you are swimming or whistling. Um, so swimming and whistling have no proprietary intended outcome except in this trivial sense. They're not substantially teleological skills. Um, other skills are substantially teleological. That's to say, a telos is an end, okay, to say it's teleological is to say that it has an end, as it were. Um, so other skills are substantially teleological. They have a proprietary separate material output. For instance, the skill of cake baking has a, as end result, as its output that you produce a cake. Cabinet making produces a beautiful piece of furniture, etc. Um, so for our present purposes, it's important to distinguish these two broad kinds of skill. One kind, as I said, is substantially teleological, and we'll call these means-end skills. So these skills are a necessary means to achieving a desired end. For instance, one has to do laundry in order to get the good of clean clothes. And a per a, very often, a person engages in such means-end skilled activity only when she seeks the end it produces. I mean, who would, who would spend their time washing clothes unless they needed clean clothes, okay? So as I said, other skills don't have a separate end result. They're rather skillful activities. And the only end involved is the internal one of engaging in the activity itself. 
things such as swimming, whistling, and reading Russian poetry. Now, many means and skilled activities are ones that humans only engage in because they're a necessary means to achieve their end result, a tedious chore that must be done to get the desired result. Skilled activities, on the other hand, skilled activities with no separate end result don't fit the means end model. There's no reason to engage in these unless one either finds them enjoyable or they're serving some further instrumental purpose external to their identity. For example, to use my example, one might cultivate the skill of golfing and go on the firm's golfing days, although one hates golf, in order to network with one's colleagues. Okay, but golfing doesn't itself have a further end result, but it could be a means to some further external end. Whereas washing clothes does have internally an end result, viz clean clothes, or doing laundry, okay, has <coughs> clean clothes as its, in, its internal end result. So armed with this distinction between our means end skills and skillful activities, we'll now consider the case for our four principles. Okay, so let's look at whether we can make an argument for, all, for these principles from the, the uncontroversial resources that are all I want to uh, invoke today. Okay, well, so I want to say that there isn't an argument for this unrestrictive still principle. So for means end skills that aren't enjoyable for one, one simply has no PN reason to acquire and exercise them to attain the outcome once a preferable alternative way of obtaining it is available. So in our laundry case, a washing machine. So women used to have to spend enormous amounts of time washing clothes. And um, washing machines, when washing machines were invented, this was just a huge saving of time. They were freed from this you know, tedious, exhausting chore so they could do other things, probably other also pretty, probably the release for other drudgery, but at least. So I think that there's nothing to regret, nothing at all to regret about the invention of washing machines. It doesn't mean, um, it doesn't mean that women you know, lost the skill of doing hand washing and that was something valuable and special that they've now lost, okay. There's no distinct aspect of human well-being that's threatened or curtailed by the invention of washing machines. On the contrary, it freed people up, mainly women, from the drudgery of scrubbing, rinsing and mangling to enable them to spend their, t their precious time on other, hopefully, more rewarding and worthwhile activities. Um, and I think that what goes for washing machines goes for many other labour-saving devices. They're an unalloyed good, and their invention and widespread availability constitutes unambiguous human progress. I mean, that's certainly true. I mean, it's obviously true. It's one of, you know, one of the features of the Industrial Revolution is that you had, because you had machine mills instead of having to weave by hand. Um, certainly in farming, it's really clear in farming that farming machinery um, made, made farming much, much more efficient and quicker and less backbreaking. So I think there's a lot of labour-saving devices which just meant that these things don't have to be done as human drudgery anymore, and there's nothing to regret about their invention. That doesn't mean that someone who happened to enjoy washing clothes by hand or happened to really want to sort of, you know, maybe reap <coughs> their barley... Maybe someone who'd read, um, read War and Peace and really liked the bit about how about... What's his name? I can't remember the guy who's scything away doing the moment. You really wanted to experience that. There's nothing to stop one doing that if they happen to want to try it out. But in general, there's no reason to regret the fact that people don't have to spend an entire day scything to, to mow a meadow anymore because a combine harvester will do it. Equally, I think, there's nothing to regret about the extensive social division of skills of labour. So... Um, I know very little about how cars work and when my car needs its service or goes wrong I take it to the garage and the mechanics in the garage tell me what's wrong and they fix it. And this seems to, this, this division of labour that we have with this, that's pre pre the prevailing condition in society seems to me an unalloyed good. I mean, some people have aptitude and maybe enjoy um, kind of tinkering with cars and I, you know, have other things I'd rather be doing. It seems to me that the social division of labour is, is entirely beneficial and there's no reason why I should... There's nothing I'm missing out on by not knowing about how cars work and being able to fix my car myself, given that I don't have the taste to do it. Um, let me say about that, 
you might worry that it's just because, you know, the kind of economic sort of uh, welfare is unevenly distributed and rich people can pay other people, can pay poor people to do the stuff they don't want to do. I think it's not like that because I think there's different tastes. I mean, obviously that's true a bit, but, but uh, maybe the, the person who fixes my car really likes cars and enjoys fixing cars, whereas I don't enjoy c fixing cars, but I do enjoy doing philosophy, which he would hate. So if it's based in differences of taste, the division of labor, of, of division of, of, of practical skills and labor across society is, is a good for everyone, and not only the privileged ones. Okay. So I think that there's no, there's no argument from uncontroversial materials for the unrestricted skills principle, and we're not missing out on something because of labor taping devices that have been invented that, that mean we don't have to spend our time on exhausting domestic chores anymore. Okay. Um. Okay, what about, so, so I, I, I mean, if you wanted to, like, obviously, you know, you could bring up some more controversial, stronger premises and make an argument for that, but, um, so if you, if you said that any piece of knowledge whatsoever is of some value, including knowledge of what something's like. So the only way you can know what it's like to scythe all day to mow the, the, the barley is by doing it. Then there's a piece of knowledge that you can't have except by doing that. And since that piece of knowledge has some value, you have some reason to you know, mow the barley all day. Um, that would be a more controversial premise. I don't think it's true that every single bit of knowledge has some value, but quite a lot of philosophers do think that. But we need a, we've been a more controversial premise in order to defend the unrestricted RAS principle. Okay, so let's look at um, whether there's an argument for the next principle, which I call certain RAS. That's the idea. For each person, there's a certain set of skills such that they have some reason to acquire each, each skill in that set. And it seems there's a pretty quick argument for that, because you might think each person has a prudential reason to acquire an exercise, each skill such that she would enjoy exercising it. If I'd enjoy reading Russian poetry, I have a reason to learn Russian so I can read it. If I, could, if I would enjoy skydiving, I have a reason to learn to skydive. If I'd enjoy listening to Wagner opera, I have a reason to train myself to understand Wagner's language so I can appreciate Wagner opera. Um, as I said, this is going to vary from person to person according to what each person would enjoy. Okay. Um, one person's evening of intense, profoundly musing, uh, moving aesthetic appreciation is to another a complete bore, sitting through a performance of a lengthy Wagner opera. Whereas for me, skydiving or caving are almost like worse than, worse than death, I think. But I know some people you know, get a thrill from it and it's what they want to spend. There's a guy... I heard into I can't remember radio or TV recently, who spent his time climbing up high-rise buildings. I mean, he's like a sort of, he climbs to the top of high-rise building. I mean, like, you know, really kind of skyscrapers. And this is, what, this is what he likes doing. It's what he spends his whole time doing. And for me, it seems terrifying and totally pointless. But that's, that's, that's what he wants to do. So fine, he enjoys it, so he has a reason to do it. Okay. Um, but... The argument for this principle is not so quick because what I'm saying is worthwhile. What contributes to well-being on the uncontroversial view of its ingredients is the enjoyment or pleasure that one gets from the skydiving or from the Wagner opera. So this raises the question, is actually making the dive or going to the opera necessary to get this? So you could have a certain, if you thought that pleasure is just a kind of, a kind of mental stuff, as it were, which has various different causes, then um, as long as you could get the stuff, it wouldn't matter what was causing it. So if I could get the pleasure of skydiving without having to skydive, if I could get the pleasure I get from skydiving without having to skydive, then I wouldn't need... Skydiving is just a means, as it were, to getting the pleasure. And if I could shortcut it, I wouldn't have to do the skydiving. Um, so I think that's a wrong view of pleasure. I think pleasure isn't just one kind of stuff which various different things cause. It's not like money. So like money, if, well, if all you want is money, maybe you have to work to get money. But then if you find you could get the money without having to work, you no longer have a reason to work. I don't think that pleasure and skilled activities are related in that way. And this is a bit where I can't give you the full argument. It's quite a complicated, subtle argument. But, so my view is that 
Pleasure isn't just one kind of stuff or thing. Each different skilled activity gives you a distinctive kind of pleasure. It's the pleasure that's proper to that skilled activity. And this distinctive kind of pleasure can only be enjoyed by somebody who possesses the skill in question. So in order to enjoy the distinctive pleasure of listening to Wagner opera, I have to appreciate and understand Wagner opera, which is a complex skill. Or in order to enjoy reading Russian poetry, I have to understand Russian. Okay. So if you think that the, each skilled activity has its distinctive kind of pleasure, and you can only get that kind of pleasure at all if you have the skill, then, then we get the conclusion. You get that you cannot get the distinctive enjoyment of a particular skilled activity without possessing its skill. And if that's right, which I think it is, then this provides a non-instrumental PN reason to acquire and sometimes exercise the skill. One would enjoy exercising the skill, and there's no other way to get that distinctive kind of enjoyment. So there's a distinctive component of well-being, that distinctive kind of enjoyment, that one will miss out on if one never acquires the skill. And that gives one some prudential reason to acquire the skill. OK, so, so that, in, that invokes a view of pleasure I'm not going to try and argue for today. If someone wants to ask about it in the Q&A, that would be fine. But I think it's, it's, um, it's a controversial view, but it's a view that I think quite a lot of people would agree with. Anyway, um, I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. OK. If, if, that, if that view of pleasure is right, the pleasure, of, the pleasure you get from skilled activities is right, then we've established the, the principle certain RAS. For each person, each person has some reason to acquire and exercise every skill such that she'd enjoy exercising that skill. And this is, to, this is not merely an instrumental reason, since it's not metaphysically possible to attain the distinctive enjoyments of the exercise of each skill, except by possessing that skill and sometimes exercising it. Okay. OK, so I think I can finish in just over in 10 minutes. Um, OK, so what about the principle some RAS, some RAS, that one has reason not to be entirely skillless, to make sure that one has some skills? Um, well, I think it's plausible, and this is something that's been suggested to me by kind of developmental psychologists. Um, it's plausible that, that for humans with normal cognitive capacities, having some skills is necessary to leading a happy life because it's necessary for self-respect. And self-respect is a general necessary condition for happiness for, for, for humans with normal cognitive capacities. Because lack of self-respect is a background interferer that prevents one from being happy and makes, making, makes it difficult to enjoy oneself. So this wouldn't be, this isn't a necessary truth. It, rather, it's, it's a nomological truth about, about hu adult humans with normal cognitive capacities. So, um, uh, there could be, you know, a, a sort of someone who maybe is kind of mentally less able, who's quite simple, might have a happy and worthwhile life without having any skills or without having many skills. I'm not saying that isn't possible, but for most people who are capable of some skills, they also need to be able to think of themselves as someone who, you know, has something they can do and has something that's valuable about them. And having some skills is essential for that. So I think that everyone, I think that's a plausible empirical case as a sort of nomological truth about people, a law-like truth about ordinary people, that you need to have some skills in order to lead a happy life. Um, and that's a non-instrumental reason for making sure that one has some skills, if it's a necessary background condition for, a necessary enabling condition for happiness. Okay, so finally getting on to the thing that motivated me in thinking about this topic in the first place. So, I think this is a really interesting and important idea, that there's a certain core set of skills such that it's a precondition for having a happy human life that one has some skills, that one has these skills. So the thesis that's underlying this is really this, is just that, CS. There exist certain core skills where these are going to be broad skill types whose possession is a general necessary facilitating condition for attaining and ma maintaining a happy human life. So it's a tempting idea, isn't it? But the difficulty is to find skills whose necess necessity for well-being is not just a cultural contingency. 
Um, so when, I, when I, I've given this sort of versions of his talk in various places, I gave one in St. Louis, and one of the graduate students there reported that in the community he came from, um, his father used to say, every, every man should be able to change a tyre. Okay, that was part of like being a self-respecting man. You could change a tyre yourself. Well, that's clearly culturally contingent. I, I imagine, I'd be surprised if anyone in this room could, 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 could change a tyre. Can anyone, this, I mean, certainly, okay, okay, a, a car tyre or a bicycle tyre. Well, well, well done, okay. But do you think it's necessary for, um, for in having a happy life that you can do that? In Texas, okay, okay, fine. Anyway, the point is the difficulty is to find core skills that are really not just culturally contingent, okay. Um, so if there are skills that aren't culturally contingent, they're going to be very broad skill types. Um, and this bit is just conjectural. It's a little bit more than conjectural, actually, but so I'm not going to give you... I'm not going to try and give you a complete list of the core skills that any human has to have. Um, but here's some suggestions. So these core skills, they say they're going to be high-level abstracted skill types, which then get more specific interpretations in particular cultural settings. Here are some suggestions. Language. Clearly, language is such an important facilitator for so many things. Um, Interpersonal, interpretive, and communicative skills. Again, you know, it's hard to imagine getting well in human, on, well in human life without them. Theoretical and practical reasoning. Finally, I suggest um, that s basic spatial and navigational... We're getting to the prejudice I wanted to give a philosophical underpinning for. Basic spatial and navigational skills are core because the capacity to understand where one is located in space-time and the ability to navigate one's way around it is a core skill. So knowing one's location in one's spatial environment, of which one has a cognitive map locating features important to one, connects directly to being in control of one's life, because it impacts so directly or massively on how one can proceed to fulfil one's projects and plans. I mean, it's, it's a kind of you know, typical scenario in a sort of thriller that someone's kidnapped and blindfolded and then they're taken and they kind of come to and they don't know where they are. You know, they don't know where they are. And that's both like a metaphor and a fact of their helplessness. If you, you have no idea where you are. Um, or and if you knew, if you did know where you were, it might still be hard to escape. It would be a lot easier. Okay. So, so... Understanding one's environment, having a, a mental cognitive map of it and the ability to move around in it is so directly connected with one's ability to act as an agent on so many things that I think it's, it's, it's a crucial part of being in control of one's life. So there are two things. There's the cognitive aspect of having a mental map of one's environment and then there's the actual ability to move around it. Because you can have one without the other. You could have someone who's physically disabled and unable to move, but they could still have a cognitive map of their environment, and they could, like, tell someone else where they want them to push their wheelchair, as it were. Um, but I think having the cognitive, having the cognitive skill, and, and in normal cases having the ability, is a background necessary condition for the ability to control the progress of one's own life and the fulfilment of one's projects. So it's directly implicated in autonomy, being in control of one's life. And if being in control of one's life is an important necessary condition for happiness for cognitively normal humans, then it's necessary for happiness. And I think that's plausible. Um, so my last principle, core AS, is true because CS, that there are core skills we all need, is true. And the, skills in, and the skills involved in maintaining a mental map of one's environment and the skill to m move around in it, navigate one's way around in it, are amongst the core skills. So, what about GPSs? Well, it doesn't mean that you can't use a GPS, of course. Um, I mean, I do use one all the time when I'm trying to get to my children's, where my children now live in South London, and there's no way I could get there without using the polite young man on my phone who tells me where to go. But, but I mean, one thing I've realised is there's is a huge difference between using a device like that critically and intelligently versus just following it blindly. And it's always better if you can use it critically and intelligently. But the point I want to make, of course GPS is a really useful extension of our abilities, and it's a case where you lose one skill, you get another skill, you learn how to use the GPS. But 
the GPS provides a surrogate for something, navigational ability, that is a core prudential value to humans. So it's an extension of a core skill whose exercise is a needed facilitating condition of normal human well-being. And we shouldn't allow the ability of GPSs to erode our own navigational skills and ability to represent our spatial environment. We shouldn't allow that to be eroded down to nothing. Were we to do so, our control of our own lives would be eroded and a core part of a paradigm happy human life, namely that one exercises a large degree of control over the progress of one's life, would be being lost. And um, actually, there's some sort of empirical confirmation of this view. I, I'm afraid I can't give you um, kind of proper referential details, but there's, you sent me this really interesting article, Peter, about this. I mean, psychologists are, are worrying about, precisely worrying about people losing navigational skills, because it is really, it's really important in the development of the brain, and it contributes, you know, that their, their empirical work is underlining this idea that navigational skills are really cognitively important for humans, and we should actually be worrying about them being eroded. Um, Okay, that's it. <laughs>